You're alive. Too bad you will die. For decades, filmmakers have struggled to adapt video games. Oh, Mario, I knew you'd come for me. The Last of Us, however, has become a sensation. Run! The series' visuals capture the essence of the acclaimed game they're based on, while also having a life of their own. How did The Last of Us cinematographers translate the iconic landscapes of the video game for television? We should get moving. This is the cinematography of The Last of Us. We'll be covering cinematography from the entirety of The Last of Us. So consider this your spoiler alert. As well as a graphic content warning. There's stuff up there you shouldn't see. Oh, now I have to see. But before we begin, don't forget to subscribe to the Studio Binder channel and click the bell to stay in the know on all things filmmaking. Let's get started. At the outset, Last of Us creator Craig Mazin aimed high. I set a fairly reasonable goal to make the best television show ever. That was our reasonable goal. Of course, this was no easy task, especially because the team was adapting a beloved video game series already praised for its visuals. As one of the cinematographers for the show, Ksenia Sereda, noted, I wasn't ready for how beautiful the game was. The lighting was gorgeous. So, of course, it was a lot of pressure to translate the video game language into the TV series because it's already beautiful. And so the show's goal was to replicate the feeling of The Last of Us video game, creating an understated realism which would immerse the audience into the post-apocalyptic world. Sereda explains this specific type of translation. Part of the joy of the game is the interactivity with the characters, seeing action from their perspective. So for the TV show, we wanted to stay as close to them as possible, and that informed our choice of camera and lenses. Today, we'll look at different techniques The Last of Us cinematographers employed to create this level of realistic immersion, including realistic lighting and docu-style camera movement. But first, let's look at the show's camera and lens choices. One of the most striking elements of The Last of Us is its expansive and detailed world. Much of this world was created through extensive practical effects. In the practical shooting of it, there was strangely little left to the imagination because of the quality of its production. Ksenia Sereda, who was director of photography for episodes 1, 2 and 7, wanted to emphasize the lush sets while also keeping the viewer's attention on the characters. As she stated, we needed to be able to stay close, but at the same time preserve the depth of background. This meant relying on many close-up shots on relatively wide lenses, which would place the character at the forefront while keeping the background present. Sereda decided to shoot primarily on 25 to 50 millimeter lenses, but she knew that shooting close-ups on 25 millimeters could run the risk of distorting faces. Get in. To minimize this distortion, she chose to work with Cook S4i spherical lenses, which offer the ability to control distortion as well as spherical aberrations. Distortions occur when light rays that are off-center to the spherical surface are refracted and reflected more than light at the center. Her choice of camera, too, helped achieve her goal of situating the characters in their environment. The Last of Us was shot on an Alexa Mini, which allowed for a large dynamic range similar to 35mm film. Eben Bolter, cinematographer for episodes 3, 4 and 5, explains the perks of the camera. Unlike the shallow focus you get from large format or 65mm, which is the fashion right now, the Alexa captures a large amount of detail in the background, so you're not just getting out-of-focus blobs. But not everything was shot on a wider lens. For the climatic battle in episode 5, 
Bolter used longer lenses to crush the depth of the images being captured, creating a feeling of claustrophobia and heightening the tension of the scene. Run! Find cover! Don't look back! Run! The lens and camera choices on The Last of Us allowed the cinematographers to subtly emulate the interactive feel of the video game, creating intimate portraits of characters while also clearly situating them in their environments. The camera and lens choices also informed the cinematographer's use of lighting. Like with their equipment choices, the directors of photography on The Last of Us drew inspiration for their lighting from the source material. For the cinematographers, the style boiled down to a deceiving simplicity, as Bolter describes. The Last of Us just has a kind of style that's inherent, and quite often it was about less is more. It was about a kind of cinematic naturalism. It was about lighting a room rather than a shot, and letting flaws exist and leaning into those flaws. This less is more approach was often literal, with DPs leaning into the darkness of a world largely deprived of electricity. Everybody I have cared for has either died or left me. Everybody fucking except for you! So don't tell me that I'd be safe with somebody else because the truth is I would just be more scared. Here, shooting on the Alexa Mini with the Cook S4i lenses proved to be advantageous, since both pieces of equipment excel in low-light situations. The Alexa Mini boasts 14 stops of dynamic range, while the Cook S4i's can open up to an aperture of T2. Sereda preferred to shoot on the bottom of the exposure curve, a term which refers to a graph illustrating the amount of brightness in a frame. For The Last of Us, Sereda kept most of the image below the 60% range. This low-light approach was conducive to the dark tone of the series and was more forgiving on the extensive makeup work required for the clickers. When lighting the monsters, Bolter drew inspiration from the sparse lighting on the xenomorph in Ridley Scott's Alien. <laughs> like in Alien, the clickers would often be given a sheen of slime that would reflect even small amounts of light, giving the audience enough information to understand the general contours of their gruesome faces, but leaving enough darkness to let imaginations run wild. <laughs> Scenes with little light, however, didn't necessarily mean little lighting setups. For the cul-de-sac scene in episode five, Bolter needed to simulate moonlight that was bright enough to capture clear images, while dark enough to fall within the naturalistic lighting of the show. Because the crew was shooting in Calgary, which can have high winds and inclement weather, the team needed to build a durable rig. The answer was a net of lighting that the wind could blow through. The net comprised 400 six-foot bicolor LED tubes hoisted in grids onto four cranes. These lights were supplemented with ARRI S360 LED sky panels, which provided backlight from separate cranes. Later in the scene, fire gave Bolter another source of light. Much of the fire was done for real by the SFX team, which rigged gas fire pipes throughout the set. Because more fire would be added in post, Bolter added additional warm illumination from the LED tube nets, which he set to fire effect to act as a fill light. Finally, dinos were placed to give more directional fire light. It ends the way it ends. In the end, this elaborate setup was in service of the reality of the scene. 
with every source motivated by elements within the world. Because most of the world in The Last of Us lacks electricity, interior locations often also needed to rely on what looked like light coming from outside. To lean into the naturalistic palette of the show, Bolter would usually try to do this for real. The little game really I had made for myself was to try to not bring movie lights inside the set, to keep all of our lights outside the set walls. To pull this off, Bolter used what he calls skip lighting, a favorite technique of cinematographer Conrad Hall, which refers to bouncing light coming in through a window on bright props like tablecloths. This allows for a cinematographer to light actors with indirect soft light that feels true to the scene. This naturalistic approach to lighting grounds the unimaginable events of The Last of Us in reality. The show's camera work serves a similar purpose. From the outset, the Last of Us team knew they wanted a gritty aesthetic that would fit the mood of the series and put the story first. Are you okay? Yeah. You're not hurt, nothing? I don't think so. To achieve this, the cinematographers opted for a handheld look. Bolter explains, handheld gives things a documentary style grounding. When you suddenly put a camera on a stick, it feels like a bit more artifice. So we generally defaulted to handheld unless there was a good reason to do something differently. According to Bolter, about 80 to 90% of each episode utilized this handheld look. But in reality, much of the camera work was not actually handheld. Instead, the camera crew used a ZG, a piece of equipment which imitates the movement of a handheld camera, but which can be mounted on a steady cam. The ZG allows for more control than a traditional handheld technique and removes shoulder mounts. It also makes things easier for the camera operator, removing the weight of a heavy camera rig. This docu-style approach further inserts the audience into the world of The Last of Us, making each traumatic event feel more real and allowing for the focus to stay on the characters rather than the camera. Bolter notes, we wanted the camera to sit back a little bit and be a bit more observational and react and be the audience and occasionally make mistakes. In episode eight, DP Nadim Carlson used the show's docu-style approach to highlight the interiority of a character. No way out, Ellie. The doors are locked and I have the keys. During the episode's climatic scene, Ellie is forced to resort to brutal violence. Carlson shot her from a low angle while she was lifted from the floor with a pillow in order to elevate Ellie, both literally and emotionally. This also allowed fake blood to spray the camera lens, slightly distorting the light and color in the shot. In another context, Imperfections on a lens might be considered a mistake, but here it visually encapsulates Ellie's rage. Said Carlson, it looked so right for the scene and it felt organic because it came from the simple and lo-fi way we shot it. The docu-style aesthetic also allowed for freer camera movement, which Sereda fully utilized in this scene from episode one. Instead of cutting from character to character, Sereda had the handheld camera whip pan, putting the audience in the character's perspective. Move! Move! Because the camera needed to be able to turn 360 degrees in the car, the team built a stunt pod on top of the vehicle so that the actors could focus on their performances while the stunt driver focused on getting the car where it needed to be, all without being seen. 
Often on a project which involves lots of CGI, handheld footage is simulated in post-production, since it's much easier for visual effects artists to add movement after the fact. This, however, was not the case on The Last of Us. Visual effects supervisor Alex Wang ensured that his team would be able to work with the handheld footage by scanning sets with a drone, enabling his team to project backgrounds onto geometry and then apply them to the camera's footage via motion capture. The handheld look of The Last of Us puts the viewer in the character's shoes, achieving the effect of its interactive source material and making scenes feel all the more visceral. I said, unhook her. I won't let you take her. <laughs> unhook her. <laughs> Move! Oh my God. <laughs> the visuals of The Last of Us required extensive collaboration between the cinematographers, directors, art department, visual effects team, and more. The cohesive look from episode to episode is a result of a singular vision. To tell a compelling story by doing justice to a beloved video game. A massive production with multiple DPs means extensive pre-production planning is a must. Kickstart the pre-production process for your next film, big or small, with Studio Binder's storyboard software. And remember, to subscribe and click the bell to stay up to date on all our filmmaking videos. That's all for now, and stay away from weird-looking mushrooms. Any one of them could become capable of burrowing into our brains and taking control, not of millions of us, but billions of us. Billions of puppets with poisoned minds permanently fixed on one unifying goal.